Okay, so coming back, we're going to be looking, turning now in the last two sort of phases of extrapolating from the books directly. Uh, we're going to look um, first at Till We Have Faces, uh, and then we're going to go through Narnia. But I want to start with Till We Have Faces, because by my estimation, it's, it's Lewis's best book, at least his best work of fiction. Mostly it's his best book because it's his most mature reflection on things. And he does some things in it, narratively, that show the level of skill that he potentially, uh, not potentially, that he had. The, the level of narration, the level of layering within the story. Now, I do think it's still a, a pretty overt metaphor, again, but I don't believe that people have appreciated till we have faces enough. I've already had one question. Actually, a couple of people have asked. I will not do, I've decided I will not do plot spoilers towards the end. Some of you all are actually in this book now, and it's one of the last ones you're reading, let's say. But I'm going to lay out the basics of the story, and I'm going to talk about a couple of the character depictions that Lewis gives, and then I'm going to try to give you something of an interpretive grid for the book so that you then can engage with it. But again, I, I think it's one of Lewis's best. He wrote it towards the end of his life, and, but it had been something he'd been thinking about for some time. And that is, he wanted to, to retell the story of Cupid and Psyche. And Cupid and Psyche, of course, come from Greco-Roman myth. They, it is a classic story that had a long shelf life in the history of storytelling. And the, the classic way that this story is sort of laid out in the original, it actually comes to us from, in the modern sense, from a, a man by the name of, of Apuleius. Apuleius was one of the great writers of this, and he wrote a book called The Golden Ass. And it was a collection of, for lack of a better word, fairy tales or mythological stories that was rediscovered and reappreciated, and in some cases, reappropriated in the Renaissance. So, in other words, when Lewis takes the story of Cupid and Psyche, he doesn't, he isn't the first person to use this story in ways that were not there originally. Um, for whatever reason, the Christian world, the Renaissance world, decided that this story of Cupid and Psyche was an interesting motif to describe other things. Uh, and there were a number of Renaissance figures who retold and refashioned Cupid and Psyche uh, as Christianized themes. Now, it's no wonder, it shouldn't, should be no wonder then, that this is why Lewis sort of falls into this category. Again, for as much as Lewis is a medievalist, he is primarily known for Renaissance scholarship. One of his actually more important scholarly works is a book called English Literature in the 16th Century, which actually puts him in the early modern Reformation period. But that being said, he knows this world, he knows the Renaissance, he knows that Cupid and Psyche as a story had been used repeatedly. And he tells us in one of his letters that he kind of got a glimpse of how to retell the story at the age, at, at quite a young age into his early days at Oxford, these kinds of things, he really found the story compelling. He thought it was an interesting sort of vehicle for getting some themes across. He never did anything with it. And after his conversion, and after his life had matured as a writer, he then comes back to it, and he retells the story with the idea of Christian themes in mind. Now, the, the, the original story itself is that Cupid and Psyche are, to, you, to quote Shakespeare, they are star-crossed lovers. They are, they are a, loving, a loving couple, they are lovers, um, who actually one is divine and one is human. Cupid, of course, is a god, a, 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 a small god, one of the pantheon. Cupid, of course, is the patron saint of stupid things like Hallmark cards and the, the little cherub who's shooting arrows at people, these kinds of things. He's very, he still saturates our popular uh, imagination even today. 
this idea of the God of love, the one who strikes our hearts with love at first sight, these kinds of things. Well, that's, that's the essence of Cupid, though, of course, not in the modern sense. Cupid is the God of love. Now, um, I've already mentioned this. I'm going to get to it more explicitly in a minute. But, of course, Lewis has had a lot to say about the nature of love. Uh, his book, The Four Loves, actually goes through some of these concepts. And he uses the Greek terms when he's describing them. And, of course, this love that Cupid is focused on is eros love, which is um, the love between a man and a woman. Um, erotic love is what we might say today. Of course, the word erotic typically today only means sexual. But it's, it's the love of, let's say, uh, a husband to a wife or a wife to a husband, let's, if you want to be concrete. Uh, and there are, there are other elements of, of eros love. And Lewis actually does talk in The Four Loves and elsewhere about how eros love has grown wild and gone everywhere. And suddenly eros love can be anything sometimes. You can, you can, you can have eros love kind of take over other loves, if that makes sense, when it gets um, unrestrained. But Cupid is the god of love. And Psyche... Uh, even by the, by the nature of the name, it, it, she is a human. But the name Psyche, of course, it's where we get the word psychology. It's the root word um, of you know, all kinds of words, even the word Psyche, which we still use today. It, in the Greek, of course, it means soul or spirit, um, the essence of someone. Um, now, of course, this is, even in, in the Greco-Roman world, this is an analogy. This is a metaphor. The idea of erotic love or love itself partnering with the soul, somehow coming together with a, a person. So that's one layer in the original. The other layer is this divine human love interaction that is, again, right there in the original. Um, and what the Greco-Roman world had done with the Cupid and Psyche story is they had essentially, again, metaphorically use this to describe some of their worldview. In the Renaissance, of course, all the pagan stuff gets washed out of it, and it becomes any number of different things. It can become uh, the love of God for our soul and, and the sense of salvation. It can become uh, one's quest to discover the full truth of the gospel. And it's, 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 it's taking maybe our, our visceral, I don't want to use the word erotic, but our visceral desires and our soul, which is seeking after God, and seeing them merge together in an appropriate way so that you're not enslaved to uh, your sinful passions, but you learn to wrap your, your passions in with the gospel, these kinds of things. It had been used in a number of different ways, in other words. Uh, Lewis isn't the first to do this. Well, the original story... Um, is that Cupid falls in love with Psyche, and he comes to her at night in the dark, this is pre-electricity, mind, um, when she cannot see him. And they are lovers in the dark only. Uh, and their love is, is true, it is honest, it is pure, but it is a love where Psyche cannot look on Cupid because he is a god, and if, he, if she looks upon him, Cupid knows, she will sort of recoil um, from having been, having seen too much of his divinity. What ends up happening, though, is Venus becomes jealous. And Venus, in the end, um, tempts Cupid, sorry, tempts Psyche uh, through a, a roundabout number of ways to break their pact, break their relationship by waiting until Cupid has fallen asleep lighting a candle, and then looking upon him. And the, story, the original story goes that she does this, she takes the advice, she doesn't trust the love that is between them, and she looks upon him, she, um, it, as anticipated, recoils, is shocked to learn that Cupid is a god. She spills wax upon him, which wakes him up. It breaks the relationship nearly permanently, and the rest of the story, again, in the original, in the Greco-Roman world, is that Cupid, sorry, Psyche, has to go through a number of labors and a, a certain quest to restore the relationship, and in the end, they are restored. Um, again, you can, you can parse out all kinds of stuff in the original 
um, uh, that this was some way of talking about how we are conflicted beings at times, that we should be working holistically, passions, head, heart, passion, all these things working together, but we find ourselves torn at times, we say. Um, and, but that in the Greco-Roman world, the, the idea is that eventually through some labor and toil, you'll come back to a holistic person. Again, that's not the, the, our main focus here. But that is the essence of the story. A lover, uh, sorry, a loving relationship, broken, and then the quest or the desire to restore it. The betrayal, in other words, is one of the main components of it. Lewis takes this story and he retells it. Uh, and he retells it in, in a number of interesting ways. Um, first of all, that what needs to be noted from the book itself is that the story is not told from Psyche's point of view. It's told from Psyche's sister's point of view. Um, it's told from Aruel, who is the evil sister, the evil, I mean, the, the almost proverbial, ugly, uh, the ugly older sister who's bitter and jealous. Again, classic sort of uh, uh, fairy tale trope there. And what ends up happening is, is the relationship, the entire thing is told from Aruel's perspective. And it plays then, the themes play on a number of different things that we've seen already in Lewis. One is the breaking of fellowship and love and trust by the nature of sin, the way it can ravage relationships. That's one. The second is this very intriguing move about the nature of faith as us being lovers of a God who is unseen and everyone around us doubting the validity of that love. That is one of the major, major themes. Orwell simply just doesn't believe uh, her younger sister, simply just doesn't, just doesn't trust this, just says, nope, not, not true. Um, and there's essentially a very poignant scene at one point where only when you're kneeling down can you even see um, the, 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 the home where Psyche has lived when she's gone off to be sacrificed to this uh, evil god, etc. So the love of, of God in human. Uh, another, and it's a little more subterranean, is uh, the, the common themes that we're seeing in Lewis repeatedly of the nature of education, the nature of engagement with the past, and the classical world itself. It's only appropriate when you're retelling a classical Greco-Roman story to actually riff on a couple of those themes. And he does that primarily through the character of the fox, who I'll talk about in just a second. So that's another theme. Um, and then what ends up happening, though, is that because the story is told through Orwell's perspective, he does something that is incredibly extraordinary, which is he paints us, the, the reader, in the mind not of the pure one who is loved, not of Psyche, but of Aruel, who is the bitter cynic who cannot possibly understand the love between God and man. All of the perspective of the story, as you're reading it, is from the sinful person, which is what Lewis adds that is not there in the original. He takes, again, I mean, that, that narrative move to just take the, the, the book at, it, at its own face value, bracketing out who, who Lewis is and what he might be saying, is an incredibly powerful move because what our, I think our, many of our temptations would be, let's, let's paint the pure I, ideal situation and have us sort of look at it through those eyes. Um, but what Lewis does, he says, no, let's look through the eyes of the bitter person who has not come to faith who doubts it, and as the book even opens up, it opens up at the end of the timeline of the, of the narr narrative, and then it flashes back. Bitter, angry, and putting God in, in, on the judgment seat as Orwell is saying, let me tell you how you've wronged me, God. I don't know. Um, this book, in and of itself, I, I, by this point... By this point, Tolkien and Lewis, have, have, their relationship has cooled off and they've kind of gone their own way. Um, I, I think Lewis has just, uh, my, my read on it, Lewis has just landed on something he wants to, to work on. Um, he worked on this, this novel uh, with a lot, great deal of care and precision. Um, he was much slower on it in, that, in what I mean. I mean, he wrote some of the Narnia books real quick, um, which is, you know, 
shows occasionally. I mean, it's very, very fast-paced. Um, there's not a lot of uh, attention to detail, purposely so. This one has a great deal of attention to detail. Um, yeah, uh, so I, I would say hard to say, probably not. One of the last themes, though, that's in this book that needs to be highlighted is the nature of idolatry. The way in which the, 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 the kingdom of ROL and her father and these kinds of things, the, 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 and her father, of course, is a bad dude, um, the way they, the, 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 the machinations of that religion to kind of make uh, their God notice them, even to the point of sacrificing um, uh, psyche or the psyche character at one point um, to the god of the mountain, and, and the superstition that that she has that she somehow has a magic touch that can heal and these kinds of things, and then they're 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 sorely mistaken and she she can't heal, um, is very much about the nature of idolatry, the nature of of how people attempt to create their own gods and then worship them as if it's the one true god. It's 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 a that's a relatively underexplored theme in some of other some of the other pieces of Lewis's writing. So there's Orwell again, the the sister. She through through a series of events, the her younger sister, whom or whom Orwell loves, overbearingly so. Um, more on that in a second. Is she the, the younger sister is the, the psyche character is forced to go off and be executed. But then, but then Orwell finds that she, that she claims, or that the younger sister claims, to have a divine lover that she is now um, uh, willfully giving, her, giving, giving herself over to this. And you know, there's lots of real poignant moments here where um, uh, the psyche character is wearing rags and she believes she's wearing a, a beautiful gown of some kind that has been given to her, um, where she... Um, abides with this God in a house that no one can see. These kinds of things. Again, very, very illustrative of the gospel, this, this idea that we serve and love uh, a God whom we haven't yet seen face to face. That that there is, um, uh, and even the sense that we, uh, this is very Pauline, um, we clothed in rags feel as if we are rich beyond measure. Um, those kinds of concepts always being sort of played in here. Um, and, uh, it, of course, the, the scene opens in the first chapter um, with Orwell sort of putting, in her case, the gods, but in this case, certainly God himself, on, on the, the hot seat. I am right, the gods are wrong, she contends. The gods have been cruel to me, is her, her, is her actual line. Um, bitter, turned inward, narcissistic, um, prideful, all these words come out of her description of what God owes her versus any type of pursuing of God with a pure heart, these kinds of things. And of course, we say it's very muddled. Now, there's one uh, stray line in the, in, the, in the text itself that I think, again, shows Lewis, uh, again, playing on this theme of joy that we had talked about before. Um, and this is, this is the line of the psyche character, where she says, the sweetest thing in all my life has been the longing to reach the mountain, to find the place where all the beauty came from, my country, the place where I ought to have been born. Do you think it all meant nothing, all that longing? That is, again, going back to Lewis's autobiography, that is a narrative description of essentially what he's talking about when he says he's surprised by joy. That there is this constant longing for something, some, some sort of vista on a mountain that, that they, he, he glimpses occasionally fragments of parts. It's fleeting. It comes, it goes. Sometimes it's when he's reading a good book, he gets this kind of enraptured sense where he's lost in the story. Sometimes it's when he hears a certain um, uh, uh, musical score Sometimes it's when it's with friends, these kinds of things. Well, what Lewis ends up saying is here in the narrative sense is this is what he means, that there is this longing for the mountain, which is, of course, uh, a, a, a metaphor for the mountain of God going up to be with him, um, that this longing is the, the, the fundamental root uh, of all of humanity, this longing. And um, like I said, uh, I've already indicated, this book, 
really is a retelling of, uh, or a narrative form, I should say, of working out of Lewis's concept of, of the four loves. Now, of course, I'm not going to get too much in that book, but it is worth reading. It's, it's a relatively short book. Um, but Lewis lays out all the different kinds of love, um, and he, he in particular says that of the four loves, the most important one is the agape love, the, the divine love, the love that comes external from us. And the, the, one of the main sort of arguments that Lewis says in The Four Loves is that without agape love, without divine love, without God giving us the grammar of the gospel, that what ends up happening is, is the other loves churn in on themselves, they become narcissistic, and they become corrupted. And so take, um, and this is what we noted with uh, that hideous strength about the breakdown of that marriage. Um, and you see this elsewhere in Lewis, where if you have erotic love, husband and wife, let's say, the, without agape love, without selfless divine love coming into both of their hearts, what ends up happening is erotic love becomes lust-based, power-based control of that other person. So marriages break down, and uh, any of you who will have done or will do marriage counseling or uh, at least uh, have some knowledge of this kind of world, one of the most common things that is said in the context of marriage counseling is essentially, I'm not going to give concrete sort of sentences, but essentially, I want this, I love them, they need to give me this. And the other side, well, I don't want to give you that because I want this, I need this, and I love you too, but you need to give me this because I love you. In other words, the, the, the feedback loop has come back to you, not a selfless giving mutually one to another. So without divine love, without agape love coming in, the, 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 the relationship becomes about power, sex, authority, control, subversively or aggressively, whatever it might be. Same thing with phileo, which is bro brotherly love, not non-agape love. Y you could have a close, close friend, but should that friendship strain you, should that friend annoy you, should that person not live up to your expectations of things without agape love to make you self-sacrificial, and self-effacing and humble, you then can want to control them. You either distance them until they straighten up, or you maybe have um, some passive-aggressive or aggressive-aggressive things to say to them about the way they don't live up to your expectations. Uh, a great example of, of this type of, of churning inward on, uh, on the love churning in on itself is parent-child because we can all conjure up the image of a parent, mother, uh, mother or father or both, who dramatically love their child, but they also want their child to be exactly what they want to be, not for the sake and of, of that child, but for the sake of my ego, for the sake of my social pressure, you gotta have to be the perfect child, or for some other idolatry. And we have this new phrase of the helicopter parent, um, of, the, of the person who just sort of becomes controlling over this child. And they become uh, tyrannous, and they become dictators. And they always, and, 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 and again, you can conjure this up in your mind. What would the parent say if the child rebels against that? Don't you know I love you? Shout, said the, shouted the parent to the child. Um, and a smart kid would say, no, I don't. Yeah, but... Of course, they're not dumb. Um, they wouldn't say that. But again, this is that, this is that thing Lewis is talking about. Love churned in on itself becomes narcissistic, becomes about me, becomes about power, becomes about control. And it, it's, it, this is a provocative, powerful way that Lewis is sort of laying out the nature of sin is not always there's a white witch over there doing some magic that's going to come and get me. But it's also the internal twisting of good things um, based on our sinful hearts. That is, by and large, a, a, as, as clear a, a, a non-fiction way of describing this entire story. Is it, it, here is Orwell, who loves her younger sister, 
but wants to possess her. And it is, it, it, the, 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 narr- the, the, the unfolding of that story is nothing but possession. It's, you are not giving me what I want. Don't you know that I love you? It's, she becomes sort of the helicopter sister. Um, but though in many ways she is the mother, because the mother has died. Um, and it is this twisted, perverted, narcissistic way that Orwell pursues her love. Versus the psyche character, who pursues her love with abandon and with joy and with self-giving, and the words on her lips repeatedly are self-sacrifice and for the other and for the other, etc. So the, the relationship between the sisters is profound. Now, people have always dogged on Lewis because he makes the older sister ugly. Eventually, she wears a veil to hide it. You know, people go, how dare you, you know, misogynist kind of stuff. But, you know, he's just trying to go very overt metaphor here. That, that, that that is a symbol of, he cares more about the, the ugliness of her soul and the way in which she has trying, the way in which she would almost rather kill her sister than have her go be joyous and happy and have joy apart from her. Um, again, think of the parent child relationship. Um, uh, uh, the, the, the domineering of a child often comes at the clutch of them. You cannot get away from me. Don't you go date that boy or that girl because you're leaving me. Don't you go off to that school far away because you're leaving me. It becomes this this sort of possessiveness. And it's narcissistic. Same thing with Orwell. And not the case with Psyche, who gives with abandon. I'm not going to steal the plot, but um, I'm going to at least uh, give you that concept. That there is a love uh, in God the agape love that the four loves shows that, is, that has elements that are, I don't want to use the word perfect, but, but that have beautiful symmetry with the gospel story of Christ's love for us. That, that, that the psyche character has somehow found true love and there, in the agape sense, and therefore that love has colored all of the rest of her loves. So she'll say to Oral, I do love you, but I don't love you in a way where I will be possessed, nor will I possess you. It becomes, in other words, not about her, but about giving and that kind of thing. And of course, the, the last bit is love for self. This is another place where Lewis is, I think, very poignant. Um, the modern world is um, in, obsessed with self-love. You, know, you do you. You work on you. You, you. you be who you want to be. These, these, these sort of phrases that are out there. And in some sense, yeah, if you're an oppressive societal regime, yeah, you should tell people, don't listen to the peer pressure, just be who you are. That's fine. That's not a problem with that. But, but so much of it, of course, is love of self turned inward that it becomes, uh, in, the, in the full sense, narcissistic. It becomes who, you know, uh, I shield myself to pain, um, I don't let others in. I don't give myself to others emotionally or, or personally because that exposes me to pain, and I don't want that because I like myself pain-free, um, and therefore I won't give to that person who annoys me or give time or energy or motivation. Uh, I won't spend time with them. I, I will only surround myself with the people who make me feel good and make me feel secure, these kinds of things. That that is a, a love of self that is turned inward. Now, what's the, what's the common Christianized response to that that is also false? Nope. It, let's flip that inside out. Worm, what, what, what theologians call worm theology. You have to hate yourself in the, in the, full, in the actual sense. That, that there is a tone in some evangelical circles and in particularly 20th century uh, evangelical Christianity that stresses that, okay, we have, we're prideful, narcissistic, and we, we, we have self-love too much. Therefore, you got to hate yourself. Like, forget you, like, like just become the martyr. Um, the problem with that, and this is, again, Lewis is brilliant on this stuff, that's equally narcissistic, the martyr is just as, in the, in the metaphorical sense, is just as narcissistically dri- driven by their own desires as the person who is actually narcissistic trying to gain power, influence, you know, good things. The martyr says, I, I, I am going to give of myself because I see it and all these other idiots don't. 
I'm going to martyr myself. I'm going to stay late and work hard and, you know, whatever it might be, whether it's work environment, home environment, whatever. You become that martyr. Um, you can think of a parent. Again, I always think the parent analogy works best. You can, you can think of a parent who is the martyr for their child. They, they give everything, and it's just because this, this, oh, it's all about them. It's nothing about me, this kind of junk, frankly. Uh, it's equally as narcissistic because either you want people to notice your martyrdom or you want God to notice it. And you think that if you do this, if you self-immolate, metaphorically speaking, to this, this vision, that you'll be okay with it. Tim Keller, I think, I've mentioned him several times, don't, don't mean to keep going back to him, but I think he has a great example, I've heard some of his sermons on this, really, really profound. He says, the gospel grammar is neither, or, neither of these concepts. It is that you are a narcissist, get over yourself, <laughs> but also you are an image of God and a beloved one and an adopted son or daughter of the king. Stop thinking so little of yourself. Stop thinking so poorly of yourself. Stop, stop martyring yourself. Um, that that when, you, when you either dominate or martyr yourself, that what you're doing is kind of the same thing in two different ways. That the gospel says we are, uh, to put it pejorative, put it too simply maybe, um, you're worse than you think you are, <laughs> But you're better loved than you think, more loved than you think you are, and you're more precious than you think you are. It's it's always both, uh, and so that's where this the, the the four loves theme really works out in this. Any questions on this? Yeah. I mean the dad, the dad of the yeah, yeah. He is the he is the epitome of tyranny and and brutality. Uh, he's saying the king, the, the the father of the of of both daughters. Um, uh, he, I was just saying, he's he's the epitome of domineering sort of power, and very narcissistic. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a good line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fatalistic. Um, uh, and, as I, and as I was saying a little bit, Lewis hates luck or fate talk, um, and so that kind of like, let's see what the the lot says. No, he's he's he, he's bad father number one um, for sure, um, but but I'm glad you raised that point because even even in that moment that that that, that is a great uh, example of the martyrdom that I'm talking about. Is it, it's very simplistic to think oh, Oral wants to sacrifice herself for her sister. She actually doesn't in the full sense. Um, it, it, it it it's it's again the appearance of proper love masquerading as self you know self. Um, self-promotion, or, or I want what I want. I don't want her, yeah. The last thing I want to say about this book um, is the character of the fox. Um, the fox has sometimes uh, con uh, contributed to some of the debate um, about what Lewis is intending here. But there, there are a couple of factors with the fox. Um, first of all, he's Greek. He's Greco-Roman. It, it, again, it makes sense in a book that is retelling the story of a Greco-Roman myth that you have this Greek philosopher, this classicist, that is subjugated to this world. Um, the, the one thing I want to say about the character of the fox, though, is that he is not, um, he is not a, a second protagonist or a second hero of the story. Um, and this is actually somewhat telling. I, I, I can't help but think, here's Lewis towards the end of his life, painting a picture of this classic Greek scholar who, frankly, is a tragedy character throughout the story. He's enslaved. He's, he's held down. His, for all of his learning, he, he lacks for joy and peace and security. Um, his advice runs um, uh, some, seems to, to have wisdom in it, but we discover as the book goes on that really what he wants is freedom and to go back to where he came from. He doesn't actually necessarily care about his pupils. Um, and I can't help but think, almost in that um, uh, uh, Ecclesiastes sense, that Lewis, here's Lewis after a lifetime of real deep learning, just sort of subtly saying, the Gre Greco-Roman character of the fox, um, on his own, without Christ, is a tragedy character, that he, he himself is there for himself. Um, you know, and again... Lewis doesn't want to make it too black and white. He has Fox appear to have wisdom and appear to be a man of good advice. 
and appear to be a, the ideal teacher and the kind of person you'd want. But he ends up not living up to the, his own philosophy, his own standards. He's, 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 he himself still is narcissistic. Okay, any questions? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh, that's probably the, the best way to put it. The, the Greek world that he loved, the Roman world that he loved, um, the classical world that he loved, has so much wisdom yet still fails to be true wisdom, W capital W, um, the true wisdom of Christ. Um, and and that, that comports with all that Lewis has to say in his letters and in his nonfiction about pagan sources, which is that Christi he, one of the famous lines is, Christianity is stronger when it has a healthy appreciation, not, not adoption, but appreciation for where these people as image bearers have landed with their, their beliefs. Um, you can appreciate them in some level. But he, he always says they're, they're not enough. You know, Christianity is, is the only true way, that kind of thing.